For more than 35 years, MIT professor Ian Hutchinson has been trying to solve the mystery of harnessing the energy that powers the sun and stars. Unlike fission energy, which breaks up heavy elements like uranium to create an energy source, the fusion process does the opposite. It takes light elements, like isotopes of hydrogen, and fuses them together to produce heavier elements. That also releases energy, and that's what powers the sun and stars. And the question for fusion is, can we take that type of nuclear energy and release it on a human scale in such a way as to produce electricity and those kinds of things. If we can, that type of nuclear energy has major potential advantages relative to fission because it's cleaner, it produces less waste, it's safer. Ian's primary research interest is plasma physics. He and his MIT team design, built, and operate the Alcator CMOD Tokamak. It's an international experimental facility whose magnetically confined plasmas, with temperatures reaching beyond 50 million degrees Celsius, are prototypical of a future fusion reactor. It's large-scale research. So when you're building a big device, it's a big and ex expensive effort. And so that takes time. Uh, the time scales are quite long. And to bring it into commercial uh, fruition will certainly take in several decades. This complex research has become Ian's life's work, and it all began when he was inspired by his high school physics teacher to make science his career path. Well, I had a particular teacher of uh, physics at the school I was at, and, uh, and in a certain sense, th th this really transformed my ideas. I realized that I wasn't cut out to be a classicist or a lawyer. I was, I was a scientist was what I ought to be. Coincidentally, it was while Ian was completing his undergraduate degree in physics at Cambridge University in the UK that his spiritual journey began. My friends invited me to go to a series of lectures that was given by Michael Green, who's a quite well-known speaker. And it was really largely in, in that series of lectures that I began to reach the point in uh, my life where I realized I was more than half convinced that, that you know, Christianity was real, that Jesus really is who he says he is. And I reached the point where I prayed in my room and s said to God, you know, if you're, if you're really there, I, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And I did find a reality there. Ian's academic path continued at Australia National University. It was there that he met his wife, Fran. I met Fran largely through the Christian group at college there, the uh, International Fellowship of Evangelical Students group. We were friends for about a year and then we started going out and uh, we married six months later. She's so gracious and outgoing that uh, this draws people to her. And I'm just fortunate uh, that in that sense, she sort of compliments me because probably I'm not the most gregarious person. And so we compliment each other in a beautiful way. That's dreadful. <laughs> he's obviously very clever and smart, but he's thoughtful. He thinks about things very deeply. And I think uh, yeah. he considers matters that other people perhaps just brush over. The most important part of our relationship is the lived life together. So Cheryl was the, the family time, the challenges we face together, uh, the successes, the failures, and we've always tried to be there for one another. And uh, that's a sense of deep fellowship and friendship and love. I think spiritual disciplines are important, so I basically I try to read the Bible briefly each morning when I get up and have a brief time of prayer. So that's you know just to do with my spiritual you know practices. I certainly think that my spiritual commitments have an important influence on the way that I deal with people and also on the way that I think about my science. The local church has been a source of inspiration and many friendships for both Ian and Fran. Fran 
Ben and Ian are, are incredibly special and real people. Even in the midst of Ian, with his tremendous international reputation as a scientist, he is just such a real human being who laughs and cares about other people. So you see the light of Christ shine through him. Christian worship is a very important time when the joy will sometimes just well up and I will just, you know, be moved to the point where, well, I can't sing anymore. He has a wonderful singing voice, participates fully in the choir, and, uh, and, and reads the scriptures. A reading from the Revelation to John, chapter 22. He's not just sort of this, uh, you know, astute, uh, standoffish academic in any way. Just part of the congregation. Most physicists aren't known for being extremely modest, but you see that sort of tempered by his uh, his Christian faith. So he doesn't become, you know, sort of a, an insufferable physicist. But, <laughs> but there's a compassion for people that that is there. Ian and Fran are family. They're real leaders in this community, and and just care for the people deeply. A sought-after speaker in the academic world. Ian's topics range from the intersection of science and faith to the distinction between science and scientism as a worldview. The subject spawned a book by Ian entitled Monopolizing Knowledge. Scientism is the erroneous belief that science is all the knowledge there is. And within our society as a whole, I believe, there's a, a, a large amount of very often implicit but nevertheless uh, quite predominant scientism, that people rely on scientific knowledge and they think that if you want knowledge that really counts, um, it's got to be science. And the question that arises is, well, what, what could possibly drive that current? I believe well, profoundly uh, that there are other types of knowledge, like history, philosophy, the law, literature, and I believe that understanding that and emphasizing that and recognizing the role of other types of knowledge is the most important way uh, to improve the relationship and un in understanding uh, between science and, and religion. Now what you can see, first of all, is this, this has very strong direction of the outside, so there's strong magnetic shear, which is good. He works well and with uh, his students, with other faculty, and he treats people with honesty and and decency, these, these are all ways in which he lives out his faith. Ian um, has been a role model in many respects. He has taught me by actions how first to maintain one's faith, one's family, and one's personal balance, while at the same time striving within this rich and deep and uh, oftentimes aggressive academic environment. He's also um, taught me by example how important uh, health and fitness are to one's well-being and this issue of balance. He's got a great sense of humor, which I think people do know, but one of my favorite things is to make him laugh until he cries, you know, it's just... What do you think about this? He's got a soft a center, you know, and he's a very kind person. Oh dear, oh dear. As I have grown older, the thing which has grown in me more and more is a sense of thankfulness. Just thankfulness for my life, for the things that I have, for the people I know who I love and who love me, uh, for the opportunities that I've had. Sometimes when you see something that you've been thinking about for a long time and you begin to realize, oh, that's what it is. That can be an, uh, a moment of such amazing joy um, of realizing that you finally figured something out and maybe you're the first person that ever thought that thought. What has impressed me is not just his depth and breadth of knowledge, the, the quality of his thinking, but how truly kind an individual that he is. He has that rare quality of caring for people to sustain our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That oftentimes is lost among the most accomplished uh, scientists. He is uh, neither self-impressed nor self-absorbed, and uh, it's this quality um, that sets him apart from many uh, 
accomplished people with his ilk. 